Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling author, and attorney, the not really mean, mean lady herself, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of Me Lady Talking. It's a Friday podcast, and today we're going to talk about things that we've been talking about. One is whether or not your relationship is with a narcissist. Now, I've been doing research for many years, but in the past year, I've been putting together a boot camp for recovering from the aftermath of a breakup with the personality disordered. And one of the things that's really important to understand is that people can have traits of personality disorder without meeting the clinical criteria. And I've tried to explain the DSM categories on previous podcasts. I don't know if it's boring for you guys or not to break that out and explain exactly how we come to these diagnoses. If you really want me to do some part of a podcast, I don't think that doing an hour of it would do anybody any good. But if you really want me to go into how somebody is diagnosed more than I've done in the past, I've kind of given a brief overview and I don't know if it's confusing for you or not. But if you want me to explain how people are diagnosed using the DSM, please send me email, meanladytalkingpodcast at gmail.com. And I'll do a half a show or so on it and see if I could explain it in a way that's understandable to people that don't work in the field. It's not that hard. It's just when you do it all the time, as I did, you start to assume a level of knowledge that other people don't have. You forget what it's like to not know these things. So If you want to know how somebody is diagnosed, please let me know. But as I've said before, having a diagnosis is important only in that if a person has certain characteristics and they're a narcissist or sociopath and they engage in very abusive behaviors like gaslighting or excessive criticism, the importance of that is that they're not going to change. And... It's very rare that you would get a person with narcissistic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder, which is the term they use for sociopath or a psychopath. You you would not get them into the mental health system. They just don't show up there. They don't think there's anything wrong with them. They think that the problem is you. And many times when you do manage to bring somebody who is if they don't meet all the clinical criteria of the DSM to be completely diagnosed as a narcissist, a sociopath, a psychopath, they're still very dysfunctional and or abusive. I know that my first husband, and I've always tried to avoid diagnosing him, but I know that he lied his butt off in therapy, both to my therapist and my doctor when he was alone with them and when we were in couples counseling. I mean, he just lied. And then he got really angry with me, and I've told the story before. We went to see a couple. Now, I didn't know anything about this school of psychology, that school of psychology. So we went to marriage counselors. It was a man and a woman, and we thought that was a good idea. And I still, as a therapist, think that that's a good idea. A couple go see a man and woman therapist. Now they weren't a couple, but it was a man and a woman. So we went to them. They were behaviorist. And I learned later, they're not interested in what's going on with you, your psyche, your childhood. They don't care about any of that stuff. It's about changing your behavior. So we went in, he was talking, he was lying. It was like every word that came out of his mouth was a lie. And he had been so abusive and he had cheated on me and he was just denying everything. So when they got to the end with him, they said to him, 
can you say you love your wife? And he said, yes, I love my wife very much. And I almost hurled like, like right then and there. And I didn't even know the term love is an action, but I truly almost hurled. I was like, really what you've been showing me is love. There's something really wrong with that. And they turned to me and they said, can you say you love your husband? And I hadn't gotten to say a word yet at that point. And I went, uh, no. And they said, no, you have to say you love your husband. And I said, why do I have to say I love my husband? Like he's been so horrible to me. What I didn't say that, but I was thinking that like, why do I have to say that I love him? And that was their modality. That's, the way they worked. And when I went to school for psychology and learned all the different techniques, I understood that that's the way behaviorists work. And it was not what I needed. And we went round the bases for about 15 minutes. And they said, we cannot work with you if you don't love your husband and you're not committed to saving the marriage. And I said, well, you know, I'm committed to saving the marriage. I just don't feel love for him right now because of some of the things we've been through. And then I started to talk about things we've been through. They cut me off. Nope, nope, nope. So they said, when you think, and I don't know how they thought this was going to happen, but they said, when you think you can come back and say that you love him, we'll work with you guys. They said, we don't think the situation is hopeless. And I'm like, you don't? (laughs) Because I pretty much think it is. (laughs) But... They said, yeah, we don't think it's hopeless. So we left, and I'll never forget the songs I live. I can see it to this day. We're walking. We had to walk through an alley because the parking lot was in the back. So we had to walk through the alley to get to the front door. Then we had to walk out the front door to go back to the alley. There was no way to get to the parking lot from the back. So we're walking through the alley. I swore he was going to kill me in that alley and just dump me in the dumpster. He said... I cannot believe how you embarrassed me with that. And I had no words. I had no words. I was so angry, screaming, yelling, carrying on. And I'm thinking, gee, I don't know why I don't love you. That's so weird, you know? Like, it's just so weird. Why don't I love you? So, at this time, I really didn't understand the dynamics of what I was dealing with. I honestly thought that the way he sat there, the way he told these stories and the fact that he said he loved me meant that he wanted the relationship to work. And that's not what it meant at all. It took me years to understand these kind of relationships. And it took me a long time to realize how destructive these relationships are. So the boot camp that I have developed over the past year And I'm really excited about offering it. And if you're listening to this and you want to join it, please, please, please send me email as soon as you can uh, so that I can get the registration form to you this weekend because I'm going to announce it to a couple of different mailing lists that I have. And one mailing list that I have is people who are recovering from the aftermath of a breakup with the personality disordered. These are very, very destructive relationships. So anyway, I'm going to get to one of the letters and I'm going to answer it. Okay, this letter is from somebody who's in a relationship. She says, I'm in a relationship where my boyfriend continuously stonewalls me. Is this a narcissistic attribute? Can we ever overcome? He criticizes me by saying that I need to fix my snoring problem because he's not wearing earplugs and asks me how many times I work out a week, which makes me think he wants me to lose weight. I'm afraid to disagree with him or get worried when he has a bad day because he finds a way to take it out on me. Or am I being too sensitive? She says... He suggested that I ask my personal trainer for exercises to work out my neck because it's the fat in your neck that's making you snore. Also, I told him he snores and I recorded him and he asked if I was choking him because the snoring sounded like I was blocking his airway. I thought he was joking, but I'm not sure. Right now, he's giving me the silent treatment, which is why I called him my boyfriend. I'm not sure if we're together or not, but I think it needs to end. I'm not sure he would ignore me forever. I don't think that he would. Okay, my 
ex-husband was terrific at giving me the silent treatment. This was before we got married and after we got married. And I've explained it to people. We were friends in high school, and then we were boyfriend, girlfriend, then we were friends, and we were boyfriend, girlfriend. We were somewhat inseparable in high school, but he would disappear for me for months at a time. He would also not speak to me for months at a time for things I didn't even know that he wasn't speaking to me. I thought he was doing something. Because he was the type of person who bounced from relative house to relative house to relative house. So I never knew exactly where he was. He always kept me off my pins. And one time I saw him and his cousin hitchhiking along the road. And I had been working for a man who was very, he was very anal retentive. And he was very clear that he did not want me to be late for work. My boss was a musician. He was a famous musician. And his house was a recording studio, but he also had many bedrooms and people would come in and they would record there. Very famous musicians. And I never knew what I was showing up to for work, but it was such a cool place to work. I didn't want to lose a job. So my boss was very anal retentive. I was running a bit late. I wanted to get to work and I saw him and his cousin hitchhiking along the road. I stopped and I got them. I told him, I said, I'm, I'm making a turn up here. They were going to his grandmother's house that was probably a quarter mile from where I took the turn. He said his cousin was sick, had a bad cold or the flu or something. So I said, yeah, well, I'll take you most of the way. If I hadn't come along, I don't know when they were going to have another ride. So I dropped them off and I went to work. I had to go to work. And I don't see him for like six months, but that wasn't unusual. And then he comes back. He didn't say a lot. We sort of warm up back into a relationship or friendship wherever we were at the time. And then he says to me, you know, I wasn't speaking to you for six months. And I was like, really? Like, why? And he said, because you, I told you my cousin was sick and you didn't take us all the way home. And I was like, what? Like, I had no, I mean, he didn't say a word. His cousin didn't say a word. Nobody said a word. And I said, you know how my boss is. And he was like, my cousin is more important than your boss. Okay, whatever. So, and even though I gave them a ride most of the way home, I was still wrong. And that was way before we got into a serious relationship, way before we got married. And I did not see the writing on the wall. The silent treatment was awful. When we were married, he would take his wedding ring and he would put it on his key ring. And he wouldn't speak to me for months at a time. When I was pregnant with my third child, he didn't speak to me for months at a time. After my second child was born, my second child was so colicky, he cried constantly. And the only time he ever slept was on me. I was attached to this kid 24 hours a day. And I had postpartum depression because it was July. It was hot. We didn't have air conditioning. I had this baby that did nothing but cry, was on me all the time. And my husband decided that I was not giving him enough attention. So he stopped speaking to me. These relationships do not change. These people do not change. They think that it's not them. It's you. Anyone who says you're snoring because you have a fat neck is a moron, a freaking moron. And anyone who says they don't snore, the noise that you're hearing is because you're choking them, is a moron. This guy is a moron. Anyone who criticizes you, and over the years, and I just had a session this morning with a woman who's been in this relationship where she's a trainer, and she's at the gym and she works out and she's in great shape. And he criticizes what she looks like. This is absolutely unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable for your partner, any partner. I don't care if they're a narcissist or a sociopath or, or just an abusive or critical son of a bitch. It's like no matter what, your partner does not have reason to criticize you. If you're so overweight that it's a health issue, your partner should be encouraging you to lose weight, helping you to be healthy. I'll walk with you. I mean, that's what, when I quit smoking, I've told people this story. When I quit smoking, I gained 50 pounds. I'm five feet one. You put 50 pounds on five feet one, it's like putting a whole other person. And I could not lose weight. I could not lose weight. I walked three miles every morning, 5.30 in the morning. I would get up, I'd take the dog for a walk. And 
I was really struggling because nothing I did. I was on Weight Watchers. I was on Jenny Craig. I was on the South Beach diet. I was on this diet, that diet. Nothing, nothing was working. And I had never been that overweight and I didn't know what to do. But my husband, Michael, loved to eat, loved to eat, loved to eat. And he never had, you know, he, he never had a weight problem. He was always very active and he had a very physically demanding job. So he, he could eat anything and not get any weight. But he would never, never criticize me, not once, not ever. Because I said that I felt like a weeble, you know, those little weeble wobbles, but they don't fall down. And I would say I had weebleitis. I wouldn't want him to touch me. I'd be like, I have weebleitis. He goes, I just want to hug you. I just want to be with you. He was so tender and so nice. And many times he would get up in the morning and he would walk with me. And if it was very icy or there was snow, he would get up and walk with me. And that was to kind of help me even though like it wasn't doing any good, the weight came off when it came off. So one day I was going through pictures and I, I was looking at them and I said to him, I said, look at this. I said, oh my God, I can't believe I was ever this big. And he said, and he said, I, I don't even remember you being that size. And I said, how could you not see it? I gained 50 pounds. How could you not see it? He said, because I love you. I love the person you are, not the body that you hold yourself in. He goes, I love you. And he said, when you had your weebleitis, he said, it would be so frustrating for me because I just wanted to love you and hug you and be with you and make love with you. And you just couldn't do it. You just couldn't get there. He didn't criticize me not once, not ever. And I know that he's sort of on the other end of the spectrum, but a loving, caring partner will not put you down. They will not say things that are totally stupid. Like you have a fat neck and that causes you to snore. That's so stupid. There has to be a level of respect in all relationships. If it's not there, it's not a healthy relationship. It's a dysfunctional relationship and it needs to end. Somebody telling you that you have to lose weight when you're in pretty good shape is abusive. It's simply abusive. I used to have a woman in my practice who was a client of mine for 14 months. She was in a horribly abusive relationship and she didn't know it. And the guy would have her take off all of her clothes and then he would criticize every piece of her body. Completely abusive, horribly abusive. And he would say, I'm only doing it for your own good. Yeah, they're all only doing it for your own good. That is not for your good. Anything that makes you want to jump out a window is not for your own good. It's terrible. It's horribly, horribly dysfunctional. I remember reading an article, I think it was in Forbes magazine. It was about what do you do about narcissists that you have to live with? It's your boss, it's your mother, it's your sister. I mean, these are people that you can't get out of the relationship with. You can still set boundaries with them. But in the relationship, he was talking, and I have heard this scenario so many times from women that I have had in therapy and in groups about being with a narcissist or a sociopath where he would think that the thing that's going to make him feel better is a blowjob. And so he would go in the bedroom and he would seem all down and depressed. And a woman who's sort of a nurturing person and she's not disordered other than being addicted to this crazy person, she would ask him what was wrong and if there was something she could do. And then he would just lash out at her because why doesn't she know what she should do? Why doesn't she know exactly what I need right now, which is a blowjob? Because of course, blowjob should always make you feel better. But in their world, it does. And in their world, she should know that. And in their world, she should not only know that, she should just do that without being told or asked or anything like that. It's absolutely abusive and horrible and disgusting behavior. And many times, the partner of a narcissist will take this on themselves. And it even does happen in same-sex relationships with both male and female where you should anticipate my sexual needs and just fill them. And and the partner of the disordered person is like, what's wrong with me? Well, why can't I know the, what I'm supposed to do? And they keep the focus on you and what's wrong with you and not what's wrong with them, which is where the whole problem lies. And the only thing that's wrong with you is that you don't go, oh my God, this person's a crazy person. This person's insane and abusive and I'm out of here. That's the only thing that's wrong with you is staying around and second guessing yourself that you should know what the hell's wrong with this person. And what this woman wrote in her email about, am I being too sensitive? That's 
the question. And I have no doubt that he's told her in the face of all this abusive criticism that she's too sensitive. It's your fault. You're too sensitive. You should just take the criticism for what it's worth, fix your fat neck and stop snoring and stop trying to choke me at night. That's what you should do. And it, you should never ask, am I too sensitive? There is not a too sensitive to abusive criticism. The things that he's saying to her are abusive. You can never be too sensitive to abusive dialogue. And if somebody's giving you the silent treatment, that's also abusive. It's not okay. Their criticism is always about keeping the spotlight off their faults, which are much bigger and much more serious than your faults. So you being too sensitive or you being a martyr or you being a masochist is your problem. There's just so much wrong with you. And they say that to keep whatever criticism might go their way away from them. I read a book once that said the thing that narcissists do when they're not sleeping is playing people. So they're either up playing people or they're sleeping. That's it. That's all, that's all they do. I really feel that if you even have a whiff that somebody's a narcissist, you truly need to get out of the relationship. It's a romantic relationship. You need to get out. They don't care about you. They are incapable of caring about you. You're only there to soothe their fragile ego and they will just use you and abuse you. And then when they give you the silent treatment and they mistreat you and they do all kinds of things, then when they ask you back, it's about them. It's not about that they care about you. It's about, look, I can make him or her jump through hoops and get them back. Look at how badly I can treat this person. But when I snap my fingers, they come running. Because a lot of times people who are with narcissists have very low self-esteem. And in the times of the breakup or the silent treatment or stonewalling, they become very anxious. They don't know what's going to come next. I mean, narcissists just keep you off your pins. I mean, this is how my first husband did it. And I didn't realize that he had been doing it since we were 16. Like, you know, when I was 16, I was thinking I did something wrong. I thought that, oh my God, maybe I should have, you know, driven them all the way. I mean, his cousin was sick, but I could have been fired from my job. And it wasn't just that I needed a job. It was like, I really liked where I work. It was a really cool place to work. I got to meet a lot of famous people. And when I left there, I had somebody else come in and place myself. And it was a good reference for a long time. So I did what I needed to do for me, but of course backfired. It wasn't good enough. And of course, years later, I mean, we could be 25, 26, 28. He's still throwing that in my face. There was a guy that had a crush on me and there was, this, uh, there was rumors. There was all kinds of things that went on. He called the guy out of the, out of a party one time. He punched the side of his car and he said, next time it's your face. And the only reason he said he didn't punch the guy right in the face was because he liked the guy. Like he, he knew the guy before there was rumors about me and him. And the rumors weren't true. They just weren't true. But he still found this guy, pulled him outside of a party, punched the side of his car in and said, next time it's your face. And so we go on and my brother, and this is a, a weird kind of convoluted connection, but my brother and... The guy that was rumored that I had something with, and now mind you, we were broken up at the time these rumors were happening. So I don't even know what his deal was that everybody knew that he wanted to get back with me. That's what he was so upset about. He felt betrayed by everybody because everybody knew that he wanted to get back with me and everybody could see that this thing was going on with me and this guy. We worked together. I don't know whatever it was seeing, but we worked together. We used to joke together and stuff. So I guess all the, somebody in the crowd was a rat and went back and told him all these things. So... The guy that the rumors were about had had this girlfriend in high school and he stayed friends with her and the family. It was a big, big family. My brother was in a relationship with her brother. They were a same sex couple. They lived a couple of doors down from us. So the family's coming up to visit them, coming up from New York to Rhode Island. And so the family's coming up. We had just bought our house, you know, two houses down. Our house was a mess, but it was a rack boat. It was a historical house. We're cleaning it up and we're in the middle of the whole thing. So he had come up, the guy, the guy with the rumors that when we were 17, okay, now we're like, I had all three kids and I had my last kid at 26. So I'm at least 26 years old. And this whole thing happened when we were 17. So it's, 
nine years, nine years. And I just had my youngest, who was like three months old. So he comes up with my brother's partner's sisters and they come over to see our house and my husband. Now we're married. We have three kids. We have the house. All this drama went on when we were 17. He says to him, in the middle of the kitchen, in front of everybody, I forgive you for what happened back then. And I'm looking at him. I said, I cannot believe he just said that. I cannot believe he just I mean, everybody was uncomfortable shifting from side to side. And the guy's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh. So they leave. And he carries on for like five hours about this visit. How I was looking at him. How he was looking. There was absolutely nothing going on. There was, there was nothing going on nine years ago. There's certainly not going on. So I have a two-month-old in the other bedroom. What are you talking about? Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And then like he stopped talking to me for like two weeks over the, over something that didn't even happen. And the part of this story that's important is if you've listened to some of my other podcasts, you've listened to some of my videos, you know that when I was pregnant with my third son, he did not want another child. And he told me to have an abortion. We had been through hell when my second son was colicky and cried all the time. And we finally started to get him to sleep through the night. The first time he ever slept more than four or five hours was he was 10 months old. So when he was like 14 months old, he was finally sleeping overnight. But I had been through such hell. He was three weeks late. I was 42 hours in labor with him. My body was in shambles and I was going for all kinds of tests. I don't know if this prelude to chronic illnesses that I developed later on, but something was really wrong with me. I was still in my twenties. And I said to him this one night because he wanted to make love. And I said, you know, go check the calendar because we were doing rhythm at the time. And he refused to get up and you can't refuse a narcissist when they want sex. It's just something you can't do. And we did that and I'm pregnant. So now he wants me to have an abortion and I refuse. When I had already two children that I loved and cared about, I couldn't imagine getting rid of a third. I just couldn't. For me, it the, the child already had a fate, looked like his brother's. And my oldest and my youngest son look alike. But, it, you know, to me, it was, I could sort of envision this child looking like the children I already had. I couldn't do it. He stopped speaking to me. And then when I was six months pregnant, I started bleeding and I had to go out of work. And oh my God, then all hell broke loose. He started an affair with an 18 year old girl. We were 20, I was 25, he was 26. He was a year older than me. So he starts having an affair with his 18 year old girl, not just having an affair, but bringing her over the house. And they're playing video games in the, in the living room. And I'm in the kitchen getting the silent treatment. So if you've heard the story on the weekend that I was due to go into labor, I was due on the 29th of November, which was the Monday of Thanksgiving weekend. Thanksgiving was Thursday. The next Monday was the 29th. That was my due date. And so Sunday was the 28th. He comes home. He left with the kids. And when they got home on Sunday, they were filthy. The boys were absolutely filthy. And I know that his father had this big deal about you couldn't use water. And it was crazy. So he comes in. I'm nine months pregnant. I'm due any day. And I see these kids. They're filthy. I get them. I usher them into the bathroom. And I had thrown the girl out a week or so before. And he had spent every night with her ever since. But I just couldn't stand her being in my house. So I threw her out. I mean, he always did things to me when I was not in a position to retaliate. When you're nine months pregnant, I mean, what are you going to do? So I usher the boys into the bathroom. And I come out to ask him a question. He's gone. Absolutely gone. I didn't know where he went. So I'm like, whatever, you know, get the kids all cleaned up and we're going to watch TV together. And I usher them into my bedroom and you know, we're going to watch TV. And I start bleeding, bleeding all over the place. I, and I'm in labor and I'm bleeding and it's horrible. And I had to lower myself to call a mutual friend and ask him to call the girlfriend's house and get him to come home. And he was annoyed. He was annoyed over the whole thing. I'm sorry, you're bleeding, you're in labor, you're really annoying me. This is how they act. This is how they act. And he never had children with his second wife. 
But most of the psychological and mental damage he did to me was either when I was pregnant or right after I had a child. And th what he put me through on my third pregnancy was the worst, the worst thing ever. So not only had he done that, but that had just taken place. When I was getting ready to go back to work and we had bought a house and I had moved in and all was supposed to be forgotten, this is when this guy shows up in our kitchen and we're fighting for five hours about what happened or didn't happen nine years earlier when I'm supposed to forgive what just happened in the past year while I was pregnant. And that's the crazy world that these people live in. And it's the crazy world they want you to live in. And they want you to be forever pounding your chest, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. When what they did, my sin was a guy had a crush on me. Like, I, I don't know how I was guilty about that. And back then, when we were teenagers, he kept saying to me, admit that you care about him. Admit that you care about him. It's like, I like guy. He was nice. He was cool. He was cute. He was a whole lot bunch of things and the girl that he had been girlfriend boyfriend with in high school and was now friends with who was with her brother was with my brother she was one of the prettiest girls in school so of course I was flattered that he liked me and of course I was flattered the guy who's dating the prettiest girl in school now likes me but it wasn't a big thing it was it was a little work situation and I wasn't even I wasn't even sure that I had a crush on him I was you know a little over guys at the time that this happened so here we are in this situation where I had just gone through hell with him I mean my third child was maybe three months old so that's how far out we were from the debacle that went on during my labor and my pregnancy but he's gonna dredge up this crush that someone had on me not even that I had on them nine years earlier and we're gonna fight about it and that's how those relationships go and it's baloney it's bullshit they just twist your head into spaghetti there were a few times during that argument where I'm thinking why am I arguing about this after what he just put me through you get so stuck in it you can't get out of it and you start thinking well if I finally say I've had enough he's gonna go back to her and this is something that I said in one of my last podcasts we've got the competitors in our heads like I'm gonna lose him and somebody great is gonna get him and then he's gonna be a wonderful boyfriend slash husband to them you have to stop caring because it doesn't matter what he is to them first of all they're not gonna change they're just looking for more victims and like I said like I'm sure I'm sure that he did not put his second wife through the hell he put me through I'm absolutely positive about that because a he was so humiliated when he got served with a restraining order at work because I didn't know where the hell he lived so when he got served with a restraining order at work he was humiliated and he and his second wife worked in the same place I know he probably never hit her he probably never did things to her because she kept an eye on him so yes he was probably a much better husband to her than he was to me but that didn't matter he was a horrible husband to me it doesn't matter that he was a better husband to her I don't care he treated me horribly when I was pregnant he treated me horribly right after I had a baby she was never pregnant by him she never had a baby by him I have no idea how he would have treated her it doesn't matter what matters is how he treats you it doesn't matter if he runs off with this person or that person it just matters that he was not nice to you not only not nice but horrible 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 let somebody else have him let him be somebody else's problem he's not the brass ring he's not the, the golden goose he's not the grand prize he's a horrible abusive critical son of a bitch let him go cut him loose let somebody else have him I said to somebody today I have seen this guy was in jail with seven baby mamas, seven baby mamas. They're taking each other to court. They're assaulting each other. They're keying each other's cars. They're going crazy. Ladies, he's not paying any of you child support. You're all going to court suing each other over all this crazy crap you're doing to each other. He's in prison. I mean, what are you fighting over? Because everybody wants to be the person that this lunatic is going to choose choose me choose me choose me why why let one of the other baby mamas have them go find a man that will support you that will support your children that will care that won't be in jail stop all this nonsense and you know guys do it too i've seen female narcissists 
put their claws in guys and the guys will be punching each other out. It's ridiculous. Stop it. Let these crazy people go. Let them have whomever and let them go on to their next victim. And even if they treat the next person better, who cares? They don't know how to treat you. Let them go. So I got to the point where I couldn't even deal with anything that that he was doing and then I went to work in the corporate world and we separated in February I went to work for a large corporation I was a really a nice corporation most of the people were really great but there's other people there are sometimes narcissists that you have to work for and this is what I'm talking about the what do I do if my boss is a narcissist, my mother's a narcissist, my sister's a narcissist? If you have one of those in your life and you have to have them, there are different things that you can do. One of the things that you should do is they will promise you the world. They will have all kinds of of grandiose issues that you're going to be a part of. And when I was working for Narcissistic Boss, they were always going to give me promotions and give me bonuses and give me this and give me that. And what happens with narcissists, and this happens in romantic relationships as well, they do what they need to do to sustain your involvement with them. I told somebody this morning if if they were always bad, if they were always acting in this abusive, critical, childish manner, you wouldn't be with them. You would have left them long ago. They do what they need to do to keep you involved. And when they no longer need you for that, they dump you. But they may not dump you for good. They dump you for a while. And then they'll say, you know what? I dumped him or her. I don't care about him or her but watch this watch watch this even though I cheated lied criticized stonewall silent trip watch how quickly I get her back watch and the getting you back the wooing you back is about them it's not about you it's not about you so yeah there's a movie Wall Street and the narcissist in the movie Wall Street is Gordon Gecko and he says to another guy in the movie if you need a friend get a dog and this is so narcissistic because the guy valued him as a friend and he basically shot it down. And if you are in a relationship with a narcissist, whether it's your boss, whether it's your mother, whether it's your sister, whether it's a romantic interest, this is what they do. They will take your valuing whatever relationship it is and they will denigrate that. When he says, if you need a friend, get a dog, he's basically saying the fact that you value your friendship with me is beside the point. I don't care about that. I don't care about it. I just destroyed that because we're not friends. If you want a friend, get a dog. And at the same time, he tore down the idea of friendship. It's basically you and your dog. That's friendship. Not what real friendship is between normal, healthy people. Normal, healthy people know that being a friend is caring, listening, being there for each other. But Gordon Gecko says in those words, if you want a friend, get a dog. He's basically saying it's a one-way street because to them it is. Because when they act like they're being your friend or your lover or whatever, they're really just trying to get you engaged in what you can do for them. They go through this very complex process so that when they need you, you jump. You don't just jump. You say, how high do I jump? They work on the parts of you that are going to be very responsive to their stuff. If you're a friend, if it's a friend, they befriend you. But as Gordon Gecko says, they really don't have any concept of friendship. They don't know what give and take is. They don't know what I do for you, you do for me. They don't know. They don't know what it's like to have a loving relationship. They don't know what it's like to be a good partner. They just don't know. They only do the good things that they do. They only do the wooing. They only do the whining and dining. They only do the nice things for you so that when they destroy you and then they want you back, 
they will have something to fall back on. Oh, remember the time I did this for you? Remember the time I did that to you? Remember the time I told you how much I loved you? Remember the time I did And it's all baloney. And one of the things that happens is as the relationship breaks down, because relationships with narcissists and sociopaths break down, that's what happens. And one of the things that happens is you think in a normal relationship, if you say to somebody, left the cap off the toothpaste, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I know that annoys you, I'll put it back on. Or you'll have an argument where it's like, well, so what? I left the cap off the toothpaste. Who cares? Leave me alone. That could still be a normal person. You can have a normal relationship like that. Okay, do I really care about the cap being off the toothpaste? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. I don't know. Maybe we should talk about this. And I talk about this in getting back out there. You have to figure out what modes of life you and your partner care about. And you could have an argument about, okay, the toilet roll goes this way, the toilet roll goes that way. With a normal functioning adult and you both come to a compromise like okay when I change the toilet paper I'm going to put it this way you change the toilet paper you put it that way whatever it is that's how normal healthy couples even just even slightly dysfunctional couples work things out like okay let's not sweat the small shit and let's work this out but when you're with a narcissist that is not how it works when you're with a narcissist little things mean a lot little criticisms become glaring problems and I'm talking about when you criticize them so you can criticize a normal person you can say look I cannot deal with the going in the bathroom and you leave the toothpaste you leave the cap off the toothpaste and there's toothpaste all over and there's stuff in the toothpaste that's got to put the cap back on you just got to put the cap back on or you buy one of those toothpaste things that cap comes on so okay that's a normal person say this to a narcissist Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The roof is going to blow off. Oh, I leave the cap off the toothpaste. Let me tell you what you do. And then it becomes narcissistic rage. Narcissistic rage. For you having the nerve to tell them that anything's wrong with them. The nerve of you. The nerve of you. It's called a narcissistic injury. And when you injure a narcissist, you are in trouble. You cannot ever point a finger of blame at a narcissist because any criticism, even leaving the cap off the toothpaste, is going to cause them to feel ashamed of what they have done. And nothing wounds a narcissist more than them feeling that they did something wrong. You don't have to be there, but if it's your boss, if it's your mother, if your sister, instead of saying to leave the cap off the toothpaste blah 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 in a critical way that you would with a normal natural person who's not going to take your head off for it with a narcissist one that has to be in your life you ask them for help can you help me with this like I'm really having a problem figuring out how to keep the area around the sink clean you know can you help me not that you would be in a relationship with your boss like that but something you have to put it in words that that doesn't attack them now again I really struggle with giving people advice on how to deal with narcissists because then people who are in relationship with narcissists try to apply it in their relationship and it's going to blow up it's never ever ever going to be good get out while the getting's good the only thing that's going to happen tomorrow is you're going to be a day older and the relationship is still going to suck and you're going to be a day older and further away from becoming a healthy and caring person when you criticize a narcissist They have incredibly grandiose and fantastic ideas of who they are. It's a completely false self. They see themselves as perfect, omnipotent, and entitled to special treatment and recognition. And I've told the story about the woman who lived a few towns away from me who was in a relationship with a politician. And his public persona was that. Everybody loved him. Everybody thought he was wonderful. And he was the most abusive, horrible man. I sometimes will think, okay, is this person on this level, this level, this level? I had one person, he was a, he was a sadist. He was an absolute sadist. He was a psychopath, sociopath, lunatic. He, in my many years of doing this with clients, the woman who was in my practice 
who was in a relationship with him, getting out of a relationship with him, I used to schedule her on Sunday. And after I spoke with her on Sunday, I could not speak to another person for the rest of the day. I was just traumatized by everything she told me. But it was, I felt very, very dedicated to getting her out of this crazy relationship that she kept going back to, like crawling back to on her hands and knees with this man who was a total psychopath. One day he's going to up the ante so high he's going to kill her. I really was afraid of that. And I can always see like, okay, this person's going to kill somebody. But with this relationship, so the guy who was the politician is just a few notches below that guy, the guy that I thought was going to kill somebody. But everybody thought he was wonderful. So when you're with the narcissist that everybody thinks is so wonderful. Your brain splits in two. You're like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm too, I'm too sensitive. I'm too this. I'm too that. But the narcissist must have that adulation. They must have adulation. They must have compliments. They have ad admiration. They have to have attention because their ego, as huge as, as it is, it's actually very, very fragile. So they don't want anybody to criticize them. They don't want anybody to disagree with them. They don't want anybody to mock them. They have to rely on all of the adulation. Narcissists understand that their self-esteem comes completely from other people. So they are constantly looking at the other people and where they are and how loyal they are and how caring they are and what is their place in their world. So if you get to know a narcissist, if you're in a intimate relationship with a narcissist, of course, you're going to see imperfections. Of course, you're going to see faults. Of course, you're going to see things that are not quite right. The perfect human being is a perfect. So when you criticize thinking, oh, you know, I'm just going to try to make our living situation or our time together, whatever it is, a little nicer by bringing up this issue, and they respond with rage. Part of it is diminishing your importance of what you just said. You're a horrible person. And then they go off and they criticize you for all these different things that you've done. And that's how they keep you off your pins because they cannot negate your criticism, your fault finding with them, unless they negate you completely. And when the narcissist rages, they have two main forms of anger. The first one is explosive. They just blow up. I don't really have to explain it. The word explosive explains it. But the second one is passive aggressive where they're sulky and they give the silent treatment. When this woman asks me, is this a narcissistic relationship? Silent treatment says, bingo, narcissist. If you want me to go into the DSM criteria, the true criteria that you need for for a diagnosis, even though you probably never get them into the mental health system, let me know. Being a person who does the silent treatment, first of all, the silent treatment is so unhealthy. It's not okay. When you're becoming a couple, one of the things you have to do, and healthy couples do this, is figuring out how do you deal with disagreements? Sometimes, and I believe that there's an example in the book, because I know that this was a couple who was a, who were clients of mine. He wanted to sit there and talk things out until they couldn't talk anymore. She would get angry and just need to go away and be by herself. And he would follow her and it would just, it would just make her crazy. She'd be like, leave me alone. She'd be screaming at him, like, leave me alone. Because she just needed time to calm down and he wasn't giving her that time. Now, again, their relationship was dysfunctional, but it wasn't disordered. It was n neither one of them had a personality disorder. It was completely workable. All he needed to do was leave her alone for a while. Now, she would have preferred to be left alone until the next day. I mean, that's how she was, where she just wanted to go, cool off, read a book, just be by herself. And the next day, she would get up and nothing, nothing's wrong. But he couldn't do that either. He needed to talk about what was going on. So they came into this compromise of they would have an argument. She would get to the point where I can't even think anymore. I need to be left alone. And she would say to him, give me an hour and I'll be back and we'll talk about it. And then, and then she would say, but I only can talk about this for like another... 20 minutes. So they each put time limits on what they need. Like he wanted to talk for hours and she wanted to be left alone for hours. So they just compromise. Like you go away and be by yourself for a while. Then we come back and we'll talk for a while. It was perfect. I mean, that's how people who are not disordered and who, but that's how people who are honestly 
healthy, caring human beings who want to be healthy, caring human beings who want to put the relationship first, that's how they behave. They don't give the silent treatment. They don't figure out like what they're going to do to get back at you. That's one of the things that the passive aggressive narcissist does. The silent treatment is, and, and the reason I brought up this couple was because the silent treatment is different than I need to go away for 20 minutes and cool down. The silent treatment is about punishing you. The I need to go away for 20 minutes and calm down is about me. So that's what I'm trying to make the distinction there. Because there are people who just get to a point in an argument they can't even deal anymore. They're like, you know, I need 20 minutes. Give me 20 minutes. They're not doing it to punish you. They're doing it because they need to calm down. So that's what I'm saying. The narcissist does a silent treatment to punish you and to make you so crazy that you will do anything to get them to talk to you again. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. So if somebody says... This person is giving me the silent treatment. All of my personality disorder bells go off. But again, you know, it it sounds like he's so critical. And this whole thing about you, you have a fat neck and you're snoring and, and you're choking me. This guy sounds like a lunatic, a lunatic. So I would suggest that you get out of this relationship. You stay out of this relationship. This is completely crazy, completely horrible. And please, please don't go on any longer with this nut. I'm going to be sending out registration forms for the upcoming boot camp. Recovering from the aftermath of a breakup with a narcissist, with the personality disorder, sociopath, psychopath, crazy people. Please sign up. It's going to be a really terrific boot camp and I'm going to be able to give you both mental health and legal information so and how to navigate the legal waters with these crazy people as well so please sign up for that I'm sending out the registration form this weekend it starts in October and I hope that you will join me if you're in the relationship with any of these freaking crazy people. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of extra podcasts over the weekend. And um, I hope to talk to you all soon. Please take care. Talk to me in the Facebook group. Send me an email, meanladytalkingpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, everybody. Stay away from crazy people. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.